Hi there, Grade Elevens, and welcome to this term's session of work. And what we're going to be doing in today's lesson is Coulomb's Law. So just think quickly if you can remember what Coulomb's Law is, what does it mean? It means we're talking about electrostatics or static electricity. But don't worry, we're going to get into it slowly. I'll jog your memory of the things that are important. And to start with, I've got two pieces of terminology that I need you to define for me. So the first one is what is a point charge? And the second one is what is a coulomb? So I'm going to give you a minute. You don't need longer than that. I'm going to give you a minute to just write down what you think a point charge is and what you think a coulomb is, and then we will carry on. So you've got a minute starting now. Okay, everybody, that's your time up, so let's compare answers. So, first one. What is a point charge? A point charge is a hypothetical charge. Now, do you remember what hypothetical means? Hypothetical means imaginary. So, I'm just going to write here, imaginary. So, a hypothetical or an imaginary charge located at a single point in space. Okay, so why am I talking about a point charge? When we go onto Coulomb's law problems, you will see sometimes that they say you've got one object that's got a certain amount of charge and another object that's got a certain amount of charge, and somewhere in between the two, they put a point charge. Okay, so it just means that it's a little charge that they are able to move around, we are able to move around, and then we can use it to solve problems from there. Okay, so a point charge, it doesn't have a specific value, okay, and it doesn't have to be in a specific place. It just means that it is a charge that we're going to put at a point in space. Okay, so that's why it's called a point charge. And then the second thing is a coulomb, and this is important. It is the SI unit. Remember, we need to work with and we need to know our SI units. It is the SI unit of electric charge, it is equal to the quantity of electricity conveyed in one second by a current of one ampere. So if we go to electricity, current electricity, we often use Q equals I times T to calculate Coulomb. Okay, but I said to you right at the beginning of this lesson, we are talking about static electricity. Now this is the thing. Even though one is where there's current flowing or charge flowing, and the other one is where it's standing still, that's what static means, both aspects of electricity use electrons. So when we talk about a coulomb of charge, it's the same amount, whether it's in current electricity or in static, and it refers to certain number of electrons or a certain number of protons. Okay, so it is a set amount of charge, and we can use it in both static electricity and current electricity. Okay, so don't get all worried and say, oh, but it's only for, you said it's current and ampere. It doesn't matter. Okay, that is the official definition of it. It's just an amount of charge, and it's the units that we use to describe an amount of charge. Okay, that's what we have to worry about. And we need to know how to apply it. And that is what we're going to be talking about in today's lesson. The board, there we go. The board wasn't talking to me for a while. We're going to talk about Coulomb's law, okay? But before we do that, I just want to double check that you guys are all, guys and girls are all with me when we talk about static electricity. So I'm going to do a quick recap here. In an atom, you have got protons and you have electrons. So I'm just going to draw, I'm drawing my atom here 
And in the middle, I'm going to have a nucleus and protons are our positive charges. So I've got an element with five protons. In layers or shells around the nucleus, our electrons are found. So if I draw my electrons, remember in energy level one, you're going to get two electrons. And then in energy level two, we're going to end up with three electrons. So that we add, well, I draw terribly. So that we add, end up with a total of five. Okay, now it doesn't matter the type of diagram. What I need you to remember is this part. These little electrons, okay, even on the inside, they are able to move. They can either leave, okay, or we can get electrons joining, depending on the circumstance, okay? And that movement of electrons is where electricity comes in. So static electricity means that the electrons move to one place, and they stay there until something else happens. Current electricity means that those electrons are moving as long as you've got power that allows them to move. So in other words, while you've still got a battery or you've got something plugged into the wall. So this is all about electrons and protons. We're talking about charges here. Most of the time we are going to be talking about electrons because those are the ones that move, okay? But if you come across a question that talks about protons, don't panic. It's still a charge. It still has to do with electricity. You can still answer the question, okay? But like I said, most of the questions and most of the concepts and the way that we're going to talk about this section are going to refer to electrons, okay? So remember that your electron is your negative charge, okay? It's your negative charge and or your negatively charged particle. That's a better way to put it. And it is found usually inside the atom in energy levels, but it can move, and it can move much easier than a proton can. The only way we can really get a proton to move is if you use really sophisticated equipment like they use in Switzerland at CERN, where you're having to open up atoms and, or, and put protons in or open up atoms and take protons out. So your electrons are the guys that can move, and they can move easily. Okay, so that's why electricity and static electricity mostly refers to your electrons. Okay, so hopefully everybody's with me. We're talking electrons and protons, mostly electrons, and that's where Coulomb's law is taking us. So let's have a look what Coulomb's law says. It says that the electrical force between two charged objects, okay, so what are the important words here? Force, charged objects, okay, it happens to say two it's directly proportional, so we're talking about a relationship, to the product. Product means multiplication. So it's directly proportional to the product of the quantity of charge, so that's amount, okay, amount, and inversely proportional to the square of the separation distance between the two objects. Okay, this looks complicated, but we can actually simplify it into the equation, and the equation is here for you. If I put all those words together, I've got F equals KQ1, Q2 over R squared. The thing is, though, we never mentioned K. This is a constant, all right? And where does that constant derive from the following relationship? This is what Coulomb's law says. It says force is directly proportional to the product of the charges. So if I multiply the charge on Q1 by the charge on Q2, I will find out how much that affects the force. So if that value increases, my force is going to increase. If that value decreases, my force will decrease. Okay, so that's what we mean by directly proportional. They do the same thing. And also, if I was to draw a graph my graph is going to end up with a line through the origin. Okay, so that's directly proportional. If I'm talking proportional, it just means that they follow each other in behavior. If one goes up, the other one goes up. But because I talk directly proportional, or because I've said directly proportional, if I was to plot a graph of force versus charge, I'm going to get the graph going straight through the origin. Okay, so I've drawn everything one on top of the other here. So let me 
make a bit of space and show you what I mean. Let's draw this neatly. So if I was to plot force in newtons versus charge, okay, I'm actually going to say, yeah, charge, but here I'm going to make it Q1 times Q2, okay, it's the product of the charge. I am going to end up with a line that goes through the origin and as the value of the charge increases, so as my Q1 times Q2 goes up, as this increases, my force will increase. If my Q1 times Q2 goes down, then my force value is going to go down. So they directly affect each other. And if I have zero charge, I'm going to have zero newtons. Okay, so directly means it's going to go through the origin. Okay, but that's only one part of it. Because have a look, I've got this bit at the bottom. I've got R squared at the bottom. Now what is that saying to me? It says to me, I have a charge here and I have a charge there. And if I was to take the distance between their centers, okay, I'm terrible at drawing this, the distance between their centers, we're going to call it the radius, or the, sometimes you see it as a D, meaning, literally meaning the distance between their centers. If I multiply those two by each other, because it's the same distance, from 1 to 2 is the same distance as from 2 to 1. So going that way and that way, it is the same distance. So we end up with R squared. But the relationship is this. My force is inversely proportional to R squared. So if I'm going to draw a graph for this one, what I'm going to end up with, if I go my force and my R squared, the type of graph I'm going to get is going to be that. Okay, so what it's saying is if my distance between my two charges increases, my force goes down. And if you think about it carefully, that makes sense because the further apart they are, the more difficult it is for them to interact. Okay, so they can't actually have an effect on each other if they're far apart. If I bring them closer together, then they really are getting close to each other. Now they're getting uh, aggravated with each other, if you want to think of it like that, because the one's trying to push the other one away. Okay, so the relationship is that force is directly proportional to, or inversely proportional to, the square of the distance between the objects. What that means is if I increase my force, I've done that by decreasing my distance between the objects. And if my force decreases, I've done that by increasing my distance between the objects. Now, if you have a look at all the things that I've done, I've used the proportion sign. Okay, nowhere have I used the equals to sign. Okay, because we're just discussing the relationship, how one concept relates to the other concept, okay? But if you look at Coulomb's law, Coulomb's law, sorry, in terms of the equation, and let me just take these out so you can see it, there is an equals to and a k, right? That constant, that was derived from all the experiments and people trying to see how does force affect charge and how does charge affect force. And what they determined was that there is a set value of difference for each interaction. And that value is known as the constant, okay, so it's k, and it's 9 times 10 to the 9. And now I've just written 9 times 9 to the 9, that's not very clever. 9 times 10 to the 9 is the value, we'll worry about the units later. Okay, I don't want to get too worried about the units now. That is the mathematical value. So when I include that into my expression, now I can change this into a mathematical formula and I can actually put numbers in and do the maths. So it's no longer just a relationship like we had here where I've got directly proportional to or inversely proportional to. Because I've included the K, I can now 
say that force is equal to K, because that's the constant amount, times Q1 times Q2 all over R squared. Okay, right. Time for an ad break. Okay, when we come back, I want you to think about how this relationship works. How do the two charges multiply together? How do they work? How do they affect each other? How does it affect force? And the distance between the two charges, if it gets bigger, how does it affect it? If it gets smaller, how does it affect the force? Because these questions are often asked in multiple choice questions. So I've got one or two for you to practice, but it means that you need to actually think how they interact with each other. So I've explained it to you now. We're going to go to an ad break, and then as soon as we come back from the ad break, I need you to get your brains going and to be able to answer the questions for me, okay? We'll also need a calculator. So if you haven't got a calculator yet, grab one during the ad break and I will see you shortly after it so that we can practice some of this. Hi there guys and girls, welcome back from the ad break. Hopefully if you didn't have a calculator, you grabbed one quickly and you've got your brains ready to answer the question because I've got one for you and it's just on the relationship between the charges how do they affect force? And then the distance between the objects, how do they affect force? So I'm going to read it through with you. Then I'm give you, going to give you a minute. You can chat to your buddies. You can ask your teacher for some help. And then we'll go through the answers together. So it's a multiple choice question. And like I said to you before, we like, teachers like asking this type of question because it shows how you're thinking. Okay. So let's go through it together. Two positive charges, Q1 and Q2, exert an electrostatic force F on each other. What could be a possible reason for a decrease in the magnitude of F? Okay, so we know that F has gone down. These are the options. The distance between Q1 and Q2 becomes smaller. B, Q1 and Q2 interchange their positions. Okay, interchange means that they swap around, they move around. Okay, they swap or they move. They go from one side to the other and then they go, they change. Okay. One of the charges becomes smaller. Electrons are removed from Q1. Okay, that's D. E, the charges Q1 and Q2 are both increased. In other words, they are made more positive. So there's less electrons. Okay, tough choices because maybe some of them could be right. So maybe it's just one. Okay, it's up to you to think. I'm giving you a minute to think it through. Chat with your buddies. Ask your teachers. Do what you need to do. And your minute's going to start now. Okay, everybody, time up. Let's compare our thoughts and then we'll compare our answers. So, remember, we are looking at the relationship between charges and force and the distance between charges and force. So, we know that force goes down. This is what our question told us. Okay, so here are the possibilities. Force will go down because... Multiplying our two charges together, something has decreased. So when I multiply those two together, their number goes down. Okay, so one or both of the charge values has become smaller. Okay, so that's one option. The other option is this is going to decrease because the distance between my charges has increased. Remember, it's an inverse relationship, so it's one over something. So it means we're going to turn it on its head. 
So those are my two possibilities. I've now got more distance between my two charges or one or both of the charges have now become smaller. Okay, so now we go back. So once we've thought that through, we go back and have a look at our options. Okay, so we think it's one of the, one of the two. Charges become smaller or distance has increased. Okay, the distance between Q1 and Q2 becomes smaller. Okay, definitely not what we're looking for. Okay, Q1 and Q2 change their positions. Right, let's just draw that one out quickly. I've got Q1 over here and I've got Q2 over here and their size, they now swap around. Does it matter? They're still the same distance apart. One just happens to be on the left now, it was on the, is it going to make a difference? No, okay, it's not going to be B. One of the charges becomes smaller. Hmm, this one could be a possibility, but let's look at the others in case there's something better, okay? Electrons are removed from Q1. If electrons are removed from Q1, it becomes more positive. Becoming more positive means that it is bigger. And if you think about it, that is saying the same as charge Q1 and Q2 are both increased. So D and E are saying the same thing, and it doesn't help us because it's becoming bigger and we want it to get smaller. So what is my answer? My answer has to be C because it's the only one that makes sense according to what we were thinking. Okay, so hopefully everybody got answer C. I've got another one for you. An electrical force exists between two charged particles in a vacuum. Okay, the system of charges is changed in such a way that the force between the objects is 25% of the initial force. Okay, so now think about it. It's now 25% of the original force. 25% is the same as 25 over 100, which is the same as a quarter of the original force. What is that telling us? It's telling us that force has decreased. Okay, everybody with me? Question, what happened during the process of transformation? A, the charge on one of the objects was doubled. B, the charge on both objects were doubled. C, the distance between the objects was halved. D, the distance between the objects was doubled. Okay, again, you've got a minute to work it out and your minute starts now. everyone that's your time up so let's reason through this again force directly proportional to q1 q2 over r squared we said that this goes down by a quarter let's just check it's 20 so it goes down by three quarters it's now a quarter what it was originally how do you get force to decrease you change those okay or you increase that. So, think in terms of fractions here. This has to increase by 2. So this must be 2 r squared. Okay. If I can get page, there we go. Or the 2 at the top 
must one must go up by four and the other one doesn't change or both of sorry one must go down by four and the other one doesn't change or both of them must go down by two hopefully everybody's with me with the maths so now we look at our options the charge on one of the objects was doubled so let's go q1 times 2q2 What's going to happen? It's directly proportional. This is going to be 2F. Can't be that one. Charge on both objects was doubled. So 2Q1 times 2Q2, that's going to give me 4F. So actually my force is increasing. Okay, can't be that one. The distance between the objects was halved. Let's have a look at this one. Force... 1 over 1 over 2 squared, that becomes, oh, let's put the R in, becomes 1 over 4 R squared. Okay, that one's also not helping. What do we end up with? The distance between the objects was doubled. And remember we said originally that we're looking at something like that. So our answer for this one is going to be D. The distance between the objects was doubled. And just to show you, over 2r squared, which becomes f over 4 is directly proportional to 1 over 2r squared. That should be 4r squared. Okay, it's reasoning, it's logic. We're trying to work out in our heads how these two affect each other. All right. That's not the only type of question you're going to get. What you're going to get is actual application of Coulomb's law when you plug numbers in. So this one here, the distance between the proton and the electron in a hydrogen atom is approximately 0.053 nanometers. Now just remember that nanometers is times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And we need to work in SI units and the SI unit for distance is meters. Okay. We have to answer this question. What is the magnitude of the electric force between these two particles? Okay, the first thing that you'd need to do, because I want to get onto one that's a little bit more complicated, so I'm just going to talk you through this one. First thing you'd need to do is you're going to write down K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Right. Then you need to go to your information or your data sheet. And you need to look up the charge on an electron. Okay, and it's going to give you a negative value. To work out what the positive charge is or what the charge of a proton is, it's exactly the same number, just got a positive value. Okay, so your information for the charge on an electron is given to you on your data sheet. Once you've got that, if it's given to you in nanocoulombs or in coulombs, you put the correct information in. And this is literally what I call a plug and play. So you're going to put in your 9 times 10 to the 9. And you're going to put in your value for your proton. You're going to put in your value for your electron. And you're then going to put in 0, 0.053 times 10 to the minus 9. Square it. And you're going to get an answer in newtons. Okay, nice, simple, you really want this sort of question because it's really straightforward and it's easy marks for us to get. Okay, unfortunately, we want to check your understanding and the way to check your understanding is this sort of question. Okay. Not just a plug and play, here's the thing, plug it in. There will be those types of questions, but you'll see more often than not, we give you the understanding type of question. So for instance, a neutral metal ball M is suspended from the ceiling by a thin string. This ball is brought into contact with an identical ball N, which has a charge of positive 80. So this one was neutral. And this one is fixed to, but it's insulated from the floor. So in other words, it's attached to the floor but when we say insulated, there's no charge moving from the object to the floor or from the floor to the object. Okay, that's what we mean by insulated. The questions are, what is the magnitude of charges on M and N after touching? 
and then how many electrons did M lose during contact with N? Okay, this is a thought question. So I'm going to give you a minute in f to just go through it, try and answer number one. We'll worry about number two after the break, and then we'll come back and compare answers. So I'm going to give you a minute to answer number one, and we're going to start that minute now. Everyone, how do we answer number one? We had a charge that is neutral and we had a charge of plus 80. When they come together, they will equalize. So in other words, they're going to move across until they've got equal amounts. So what we do is we go Q1 plus Q2 over 2. So we're going to end up with 0 plus plus 80 divided by 2. So on each one, we're going to have a charge of 40 nanocoulombs. All right. Okay. Nicely done. You worked really well during that part of the lesson. What we're going to do now is, lucky you, we're having an ad break. You can breathe. You can shake your head, get your brains awake again, and we're going to go on to some more calculations just after the ad break. I'll see you shortly after this. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a chance to have a quick rest, do what you need to do. Make sure that you've got your calculators for this because now we're going to need them. Okay, so remember I showed you just at the end of the last segment, it was a thinking question. Okay, how do you rationalize the multiple choice questions that I asked you? Thinking question. What I've got for you now is Coulomb's law calculation. Okay, but this one is a tough one. It's one in two dimensions, okay? But before we get there, I want to show you a parallel with Newton's law of universal gravitation. Okay, so look at the board with me. Newton's law of universal gravitation has this setup. Force is equal to G M1 M2 over R squared. Newton and Coulomb have got a lot in common. The relationship between their objects and their law. Okay, have a look at this. Both are talking about force. Both have got a constant in terms of Newton. It's G in terms of Coulomb. It is K, but their relationship is what we're looking at here. And the reason I'm drawing your attention to this is this makes for a really nice question where you can combine both concepts okay so I can ask you a Coulomb question and then I can ask you perhaps something to do with Newton's law of gra universal gravitation okay so have a look at how the relationship works for gravitation force is directly proportional to the product this time it's of the masses Coulomb it's a product of the charges you, Newton's law Force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the objects. Coulomb's law, force is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between the charges. Okay, so as a teacher, if I want to check your understanding of both laws, I'm going to set up a question that has both in them. It can do, be the same two objects, but one happens they have charges on them. And then later I introduce the masses and we can talk about how the force due to gravity, what that force is, and then the force due to the charges. And we can maybe then do a comparison. So just wanted to show you that they've got very, very similar, or in fact they're 
thinking is identical, but one applies to mass, the other one applies to amount of charge, okay? But the relationship, the products of the charge, the product of the mass is directly proportional to force, and the square of the distance between the two is inversely proportional to the force. Concepts are the same, okay? Just one happens to apply to force, one, sorry, one happens to apply to mass, the other one happens to apply to amount of charge. So just keep that in the back of your mind because this is a really nice way for us as teachers to test your understanding. And I know sometimes you think that we're just out to trick you. The tricks are actually a way of testing specific understanding. Okay, so we are looking to see what you know. That's what a test is. And yes, it's under pressure. And yes, it's under certain conditions. We know that. But it tests understanding. It's so that you don't just put things down and put numbers in and you just go for an answer. We want to see that you understand what you're answering. So this will be a really nice question. Draw a comparison between the two. Okay, so just keep that in the back of your mind when you're preparing for your next test or your next set of exams. Right. Onto the good stuff. Now, this one's going to be challenging. Three charges are arranged as shown. I want you to find the net force on number one, the five nanocoulomb charge, and then two, the negative three nanocoulomb charge. Right. So, how do we tackle this? I'm going to do this with you. First thing, where's the five nanocoulomb? Here's five. Right. So, we're going to have that's a positive, that's a positive, that's a negative. How do these interact? Okay, what do positives do? They push each other away. So if I draw a force diagram, here's my five nanocoulomb. The force of the six acting on the five, so I'm gonna have force of the six acting on the five, that goes that way. What do opposites do? What do positives and negatives do? They are attracted to each other, okay? So the positive is going to be attracted to the minus three. So here I've got the force of the five on the three. Okay, you can represent it any way you like, okay? I'm just drawing the diagram. It's not necessarily going to be an official diagram. It's just to show you what's going on, okay? So ultimately, we need to know what the effect uh, is or what the force is, that point there. So what do we do? We need to know how 6 and 5 interact and how 3 and 5 interact, and we'll take it from there. So let's do this quickly. I'm going to extend my page already, and I'm going to do Coulomb's law, K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. I'm starting with the 6 and the 5. Okay, so my K is 9 times 10 to the 9, my six nanocoulombs, okay, six times 10 to the minus nine, because we're going nano, and five times 10 to the minus nine. Do we need to worry about the positives and the negatives? You don't actually, okay? But go with what your teacher tells you. If they tell you to include direction or you need to have chosen a direction before, that's how you need to work, okay? I like to put my numbers in first and then reason out the direction later. You need to do what your teacher has asked you to do, okay? Then we need to take into account the distance. And I have a look here. It tells me that it's 0, 0,3. So I'm going to go 0 0.3 squared. And for this, we are definitely going to need the calculator. Let's put the calculator over here. I'm going to use my fraction button, 9 times 10 to the 9, multiplied by 6 times 10 to the minus 9, multiplied by 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay, you know me, I like using brackets. And then I'm going to go 0 0.3 uh, squared. And I'm going to get an answer of 3 over, what's it, a million. So we're going to make this, so I go back here, come on, equals 3 times 10. What's it, to the positive or negative 6? I can't remember, negative 6. Okay, 3 times 10 to the minus 6 newtons. Okay, so that is my first force here. 3 times 10 to the minus 6. All right, now let's do my second one. Same thing, I'm going to go force is KQ1, Q2 
over r squared. So 9 times 10 to the 9. And what have we got? We've got the 5 still. So 5 times 10 to the minus 9. And in this case, I've got 3 times 10 to the minus 9. I'm not going to worry about the negative at the moment. And here my distance is 0, 1 squared. So we go back to our calculator and let's clear it. I'll move my calculator across this side now. So again, my fraction button, 9 times 10 to the negative 9. Okay, and like I said, I like using brackets, multiplied by 5 times 10 to the negative 9. And I think by now you also know that I like to use the exponent, the times 10 to the power of button at the bottom, just so that I know that I'm getting the right number of places and I don't have to concern myself that I'm making a mistake somewhere in my calculation because there is nothing worse than getting everything right and then you've actually made a mistake on your calculator. It's really, really frustrating. Okay, 1.35 times 10 to the minus 23. So 1.35 times 10 to the minus 23 newtons. Okay, so we have got these two forces acting at an angle to each other, a right angle. Okay, so what can we do? We can actually use a force diagram. Okay, so let's see if I've got some more space here. I do. So I'm going to do a head to tail diagram. I'm going to put in my, this is my 6 on my 5, and we said that that was 3 times 10 to the minus 6. And then I'm going to have this one, which is going to be 1, 1,35 times 10 to the minus 23. But I actually just want to check that number because something doesn't look right. And this is what I recommend that you do as well. If you're just thinking, yeah, that number doesn't look right, go back and do your maths again. Okay, so I'm going to do my maths again because something doesn't look right to me. So I'm going to have 9 times 10 to the minus 9. Now, I am going to put this one in brackets. I just want to make sure that everything's in brackets here. Brackets. There we go. I'll be gentle. Multiplied by, what did we say? It was 5 times 10 to the minus 9. And we're going to multiply that by 3 times 10 to the minus 9. And down here, I'm going to have 0 0.1 squared and yep I get the same answer okay that's fine so I've I've made myself happy here now what do I do what's really nice about this is that it's Pythagoras because have a look here here is my resultant is my resultant there's my 90 degrees so what I can do is I can put this into Pythagoras and I'm going to go um, let's make this A, and we'll make that B, and we'll make that C. So I'm going to go A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So my A squared is going to be 3 times 10 to the minus 6 squared plus 1.35 times 10 to the minus 23 all squared equals C squared. So I'm now just going to go back to my calculator and I'm going to put this in. But like I said to you, I'm something, so I'm, I don't know if I'm happy about that first one. So I'm going to just, sorry guys and girls, I don't like it when I'm not happy about things. And this is what you should have in your, going through your minds as well, is if there's something you're just not happy with with a sum, just double check. So I'm going to do my first one again, multiply it by. 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Okay. Oops. 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Come on. Go up. 5 times 10 to the minus 9. Multiplied by 6 times 10 to the minus 9. No, you see there's my problem. 6 times 10 to the minus 9. No. Put in a bracket. And I'm going to go 0 0.3. 3 squared. 
And my answer is, ah, see, I knew it. 3 times 10 to the minus 24. I knew there was something wrong there. So that's minus 24. Much happier now. Okay. So my C value is equal to the square root of all of these. Okay, I'm not going to write them out again because we're running out of time, but that's what my C value is equal to. So if we put it into our calculator, okay, I now need to go square root of, I'll do my bracket again, 3 times 10 to the minus 24, minus 24, squared plus 1.35 times 10 to the minus 23 all squared. Why did I put a fraction button in? I don't know. I'm just going to put this over 1. I don't know why I chose a fraction, but anyway. You can see now, because I now don't, I'm not happy with any of the maths that I did just now. I'm not happy with anything that I'm doing. So I end up with 1,3829 times 10 to the 23. C equals 1,3829 times 10 to the 23. And the really good news is that because it's a right angle triangle, we know that that is going to be 45 degrees. Okay, so that is my value of C. Okay, the tricky one is this one. The tricky one is the minus 3. Okay, what I would like to do is I'm going to do this as a revision session when we get to our revision question. Okay, so I'm not going to leave you hanging. Okay, I'm going to tell you now how to answer it, and then we will go through it in a revision session. Okay, we do the same thing. What is the force of the 5 on the 3, what is the force of the 6 on the 3? And this is where it starts to get tricky, okay? Because it's no longer in a straight, it's not horizontal, right? So we are going to need to employ a little bit of trigonometry, okay? We're going to need some trig, All right? Once we get to that stage, it's going to give us, it's going to help us with the final answer. But in terms of how these two affect each other, we can still use f equals k q1 q2 over r squared. Okay, we don't need the angles just yet. We just need to work out the first force, work out the second force. When we put the two forces together, that is when we're going to need the trigonometry. Okay, don't panic. If you want to, and I'm sure you've done this in class. In fact, I know that you've done this in class. Ask your teacher to do it with you on the board now when we finish our lesson, okay? Or keep it over for the next time that you have class and go through it. It's exactly the same thing up to the last part where we need to include trigonometry, okay? I will go through it in a revision session with you, so please don't worry about that. If you want to know now because you've got a test coming up, chat to your teacher, get them to go through it with you. Or chat to somebody who's in matric this year and they've done it before, okay, and they will help you through it. But we will go through it in a revision session. That's it for today. I hope you have a good week and I'll see you in the next lesson.